So, for the new faces, and there's a bunch of new faces, I suspect, because you're here to hear, hear Robert Wistra. So, my name is Charles Small, I'm the director of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And please feel free to take uh, our program for the rest of the academic year. We're going to continue with the seminar series um, after the holidays. So, today it's really a privilege and an honor to be able to introduce to you Robert Wistra. Robert is one of the preeminent scholars on the study of antisemitism in the world. He holds the Neuberger Chair for Modern European History at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he's been the head of the Vidal Sassoon International Center for the Study of Antisemitism since 2002. He was recently awarded a prize for lifetime achievement by the New York-based Journal for the Study of Antisemitism, which described him as the leading scholar in the field of anti-Semitism studies today. His books include Socialism and the Jews, which was published by Oxford University Press. He received the American Jewish Committee Award for his book, The Jews of Vienna in the Age of Franz uh, Joseph, also by OUP in 1991, which won the Austrian State Prize for Dunbia, History of an Anti-Semitism, he also published, the, sorry, The History of Antisemitism. He also published a famous, uh, well-received book, which was made into a film called The Longest Hatred. He received the H.H. H. Wingate, Wingate Prize for fiction, sorry, for nonfiction in the United Kingdom. It was also the basis for a PBS documentary film, which Professor Wister scripted and co-edited. Among his other books are Hitler and the Holocaust, which was published by Random House in 2001, and it's been, this book has been translated into 25 languages. Between 1999 and 2001, Professor Wistrich was one of six scholars which was appointed by the International Catholic Jewish Historical Commission to examine the wartime record of Pope Pius XII. In June 2003, initiated and acted as chair, sorry, as chief historical advisor for a BBC documentary film on contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism entitled Blaming the Jews. And I'll just say as a footnote, it's still politically incorrect, this issue of radical political Islam and Islamic anti-Semitism, but to do this uh, in 2007, it was even more difficult. So it's important that to, to know that it wasn't an easy thing to do in those days. It's becoming more easier, but it's uh, still an important hurdle to overcome, to look at these issues uh, straight on. In 2007, he published um, Laboratory for World Destruction, Germans and the Jews in Central Europe from the University of Nebraska Press. His 1,200-page book entitled A Lethal Obsession, Antisemitism from Antiquity to Global Jihad was published in uh, 2010, and it's a widely acclaimed book as one of the most definitive studies on the subject. Robert Wistrich's newest book, entitled From Ambivalence to Betrayal, The Left, the Jews, and Israel, was published in 2012. And it described, it, it, and described what the Jewish Ideas Daily as one of the best books of the year. In April 2013, Robert Wistrich was named one of the most 100 uh, most influential, positive influential people in the Jewish world, and in Israel at a gala dinner for Algemeiger, the newspaper here in New York. In June 2014, the international exhibition, which he authored, uh, entitled People, Book, and Land, the 3,500-year relationship of the Jewish people with the Holy Land, was inaugurated at the um, headquarters of UNESCO in Paris. And not only did Robert uh, play a crucial role in creating the exhibit, he uh, played an important role in getting it uh, displayed at UNESCO, which various nations in the Middle East and even in the Western world uh, seem to try and thwart. Uh, today's lecture is entitled Antisemitism and the Left, and it really is a distinct privilege and honor to welcome you. Thank you indeed, Charles, for those generous words of introduction. It's a great privilege and pleasure for me to be here at Columbia University 
for the first time since 1969, that's a hell of a long time, and in a moment <coughs> I will say a few words about that because it's actually relevant to how I came to be involved and engaged with this particular subject. I was a, a student in the United States in the late 60s. Uh, I arrived here when I was 21 years old and began um, my studies at Stanford University. And between uh, 1966, the summer of 1966, and uh, the middle of 1969, I was, at least uh, formally speaking, engaged in uh, studying for my second uh, degree. I say formally engaged because for those of you whose memories stretch back to that period, uh, it was, I think, a time of intense turmoil, perhaps unprecedented in the post-war era for the student generation. Certainly in the United States, I doubt if there's ever been a comparable period uh, to those years. The Vietnam War, the draft, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the end of the 60s, the black power movement, um, and, and here is where we encounter our first link with this topic, the Israel-Arab conflict, as it was still called at that time, in the wake of the Six-Day War of June 1967. And during those years, the only uh, period of time that I lived uh, extensively in the USA, um, I became uh, acquainted with the left-wing milieu, which was very varied, very fragmented, <coughs> different in almost every aspect to the left as I had known it growing up in Europe and predominantly in the United Kingdom. Uh, although I wasn't born there, I grew up in the UK and I went to university at Cambridge in, in the UK. And before my earlier to Israel, that was uh, the main country of my residence. The American left was very, very different. And uh, the issues I've already mentioned predominated at that time. I was struck by, of course, the presence of Jews in a considerable numbers and in prominent positions in different sects and uh, movements of the left, both the counter-cultural movements and the more politically minded ones. And already then, Although I was by no means a convinced Zionist, and I had just spent a year uh, in Israel, but I had, um, I had my own problems and re reservations about that experience, I was disconcerted already then, but also intrigued by the rather sudden shift that took place around 1968 in attitudes on the left towards the state of Israel. By and large, those attitudes had been favourable before. This was true also in Europe. But there was clearly a sea change. Uh, the first time I encountered it was when I went to a public meeting in Oakland, California, which was organized by the SNCC Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Nonviolence is not the way I would describe the rhetoric at that meeting or more generally. The main speaker was Stokely Carmichael, who was a spokesman. That was his name at the time. Uh, he was a spokesman for black power, black nationalism, back to Africa. Um, 
identification of Afro-Americans with uh, third world national liberation movements, extremely anti-American, and also, in an embryonic way, very anti-Zionist. Um, in fact, the slogan that stuck in my mind from that first encounter it, that I had personally experienced with anti-Zionism was the definition of fascism that he offered. That fascism is kosher nationalism plus imperialism, uh, meaning basically US imperialism. And on the white radical side, um, I encountered this strange need to cast American society in the most uh, garish, lurid colours as a new edition of fascism. America was spelt with a K. America, you know, as if it's a Germanic uh, version that recalls some aspects of National Socialism. And I think that's the first step that set me on the road to investigating what were the sources intellectually, politically, ideologically of leftist attitudes. Left is a very broad, of, of course, uh, label. We'll try and get into some of the uh, different strands. Where did it begin? How has it evolved? And does it help us to explain where we are at today with the fairly obvious, I would say, hostility of many sections of the left towards Zionism, Israel, and to a certain extent the Jewish people more generally. So, I'll try and take you on a very condensed journey through um, various stages of this evolution. And if we can begin with the first item, which is a provocative question, of course, um, was Karl Marx a racist? Of course, when I begin with Marx, that is partly for convenience. There was socialism before Marx. Uh, there were left-wing movements before Marx. We can certainly um, deal with that in the questions. I'll allude to it a little bit. But Marx is the founder of Marxism. And Marx was the most important single thinker that the socialist and communist movements ever produced. So he is the fons et origo of modern socialism, <coughs> certainly scientific quote-unquote socialism. And I just selected a couple of quotes uh, from the different uh, texts that we might have taken, the most important being a text of 1844 in the original German Sur Judenfrage on the Jewish question. Marx was a young man, 26 years old, was about to leave Germany permanently for France and then for Belgium and finally for London and his exile in England. But this text was sparked off by a debate in Germany about Jewish emancipation. Remember, in 1844, the Jews in Germany did not enjoy civic equality. So they were languishing some 50 years already behind the French Jews who had been emancipated in 1789 91 and the American Jews, who had the good fortune that they never actually had to go through a process of transition to emancipation. They arrived pretty much as the non-Jews did, with one or two differences in certain colonies, but uh, they didn't have to transit from a feudal order or an established church or many other 
aspects of a medieval uh, European society. Germany in 1844 was not a united Germany, of course. On the contrary, there were more than 30 uh, different states. Prussia was the most important. It also controlled the Rhineland, where Marx was born. Born to a Jewish family, but a family that converted when he was six years old to Protestantism. So he was in a very ambivalent position. I think the problem of his Jewish identity, he resolved in a particularly brutal fashion by basically um, negating in a radical way. And here I think a pattern is set for many Jews in that situation, subsequently, negating Judaism, negating a Jewish identity, any sense of belonging to a Jewish community, certainly any Jewish national identity, which in any case, in that period, would not have made much sense. But what Marx does, which had not been done previously, in the debate on Jewish emancipation is that he, on the one hand, says, yes, in the formal sense, we cannot be opposed to civic equality for the Jews because this is a necessary stage in the development of bourgeois society. He uses the term civil society, if we want to be precise, bourgeoisie Gesellschaft, which could be translated as bourgeois society, but in fact he meant civil society, or perhaps he meant bourgeois society, but because of censorship he didn't want to uh, have it understood that way. But what he then says is that this kind of emancipation is essentially without value because a civil or bourgeois society is founded on atomistic relationships based on egoism, self-interest, and um, what he calls practical need. And he identifies Judaism, he actually defines Judaism, supposedly in a materialist way, as being the religion of practical need, of buying and selling. He identifies Judaism with the market. But the market is a thoroughly negative principle for the young Marx, and it remains so for socialists in general throughout, throughout the century. In the course of this text, he goes much further. There are statements of the kind like, money has become a world power, and the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical spirit of the Christian people. Interestingly, he singles out the United States. In 1844, among other things, he had read Alexis de Tocqueville, was one of the sources, for his picture of American society. He said, here is the proof, this is a Judaized society. America is a Judaized society in the material Marxian sense. The Christians of America are Jews. They are Jews because their religion is based on the principle of buying and selling. And in fact, the profession of the clergyman, for instance, he, he describes it in very derogatory terms as uh, being essentially a commercial enterprise. Sometimes when I watch the advertisements here on American television, I, I can see, uh, you know, what might be referred to, but this is a very Marxian procedure. At the same time, and here we come to the question of race, and I have to race through this, um, I do believe that Marx was a racist. Shocking though this thought is when we consider, and this is a central paradox in my whole uh, presentation, that precisely those on the left who have always claimed and continue to claim that they are in the vanguard of progress. They are the enlightened ones who are bringing emancipation and liberation to all of humanity. Um, a credo 
that transcends religion, ethnic, uh, background, um, that is beyond nationality, that precisely many of the leading thinkers, let alone the ordinary workers, should in fact exhibit so frequently the whole range of prejudices that we could imagine, including racial prejudices, must give us pause. And one illustration among many that, that I have brought, uh, I see we've moved on to Proudhon, but I just want to deal with an earlier quote, if I may, about Ferdinand Lassalle. Marx and Lassalle were comrades in arms. Um, if we can go back. We're racing ahead, but we need to go back. Uh, that's it. There we have Ferdinand Lassalle in the bottom right-hand corner. Ferdinand Lassalle was also a German Jew. And he was the founder of the German Social Democratic Party. The two great figures of German social democracy were both Jewish. Karl Marx, albeit converted Jew, who despised his Judaism, and Ferdinand Lassalle, who founded the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, in 1863. And they worked together, although in a very tense relationship. Lassalle lived in Germany, Marx in exile in London. Marx was the theoretician, Lassalle was the leader of the movement, and very popular in his brief career as the creator, founder, and organizer of the oldest, most powerful, most important labor movement in the world, the German social democracy, until the First World War, certainly far and away the most powerful movement. And Lassalle, like Marx, thoroughly despised his Judaism, although he didn't begin that way. As an adolescent, he even dreamed of leading the Jews to freedom and independence. But he became disillusioned, particularly after reading Hegel. Hegel seemed to have this influence on many uh, young Jewish intellectuals of that generation. And Marx writes in a letter to Engels these, uh, these comments on Lassalle, which are a pure distillation of racism. He writes this in 1862. As the shape of his head and the growth of his hair indicates, he, meaning Lassalle, is descended from the Negroes who joined in the flight of Moses from Egypt. Now this union of Jewishness with Germanness, Judentum and Deutschtum, on a Negro basis, was bound to produce an extraordinary hybrid. And further on, he talks about Lassalle's, one of Lassalle's primary characteristics, his pushiness. He was very pushy. Soudre English. His pushiness is nigger-like. I don't know, if this is not racism, I don't know what is. <laughs> And, and this is 1862, the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, the emancipation of the Negroes. By the way, Marx, has to be said, supported Lincoln. So, a further ambivalence. The man... In many other comments, I didn't just take arbitrarily one little comment, it's throughout the correspondence, is prejudiced in this way against Jews, against Negroes, against other groups too. But on the matter of principle, yes, he supported Lincoln, indeed admired Lincoln. Same with the Jewish emancipation issue, made consistent anti-Jewish remarks called for the disappearance of Judaism 
which continued to be a demand of many prominent Marxists later. And this coexists with the emancipatory worldview, so to speak, of Marxism. If we can now move on to Proudhon. And just to be even-handed, we can take Marx's great counterpart, the founding father of anarchism, in the 19th century, the leading light of French socialism, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, a great humanist, and I say that without irony. As a student, I read Proudhon without any knowledge of what his views were about the Jewish question. And I was thrilled. And I thought, how insightful, how uh, libertarian, how refreshing Proudhon's ideas were. He and Marx were polar opposites in their um, thought process. And here we see, in Proudhon's notebooks of 1847, a program that I can only describe as the Nazi program of the 1930s. He talks about the expulsion of the Jews from France, about abolishing their synagogues, preventing them from having any gainful employment, pursuing the abolition of this cult. Proudhon, the anti-clerical, says, no wonder the Christians call them deicides. The Jew is the enemy of the human race. One must send this race back to Asia or exterminate it. Pretty much the National Socialist program of the mid 1930s. Either expel all the Jews or exterminate them. This by a libertarian, humanist, anarchist socialist, the leading socialist thinker of 19th century France. No wonder this is not highlighted in the literature about Proudhon. And culminating in a kind of Kristallnacht Christ crescendo, by fire or fusion or by expulsion, the Jew must disappear. And those who followed Proudhon in the French socialist tradition, Toussenel, Blanqui, uh, many others, Georges Sorel, at the beginning of the 20th century, who was a great admirer of Proudhon, you find the residues of this anti-Semitism. Next. I wouldn't like to discriminate against the British Labour. This is, yes, this is, we have now come to the British Labour movement. The British Labour movement was not, on the whole, Marxist, but the exception was this man, Henry Hindman, who founded the English... Social Democratic Federation in 1882. And Henry Hindman was that rare breed among socialists in England at that time. He was actually an intellectual. And Hindman knew Marx and definitely admired him even though in his way of life, his manner, his dress, Heinemann was like, much more like a Tory gentleman. You know, always wore a frock coat, a top hat, a very imposing figure, also an expert on gambling on the stock exchange, which of course is also an honoured Marxist tradition. You know how Marx kept himself afloat because his great friend and comrade Frederick Engels made a fortune on the Manchester Stock Exchange and that's what kept Marx going and able to write Das Kapital. And uh, Heinemann was also one who played the Stock Exchange and also led the Marxist movement in Britain. He was a rabid anti-Semite and I say that having read quite carefully the journal which he was the editor of called Justice. And during the Boer War, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, 
This was as close as the British Empire came to their version of Vietnam. It was a kind of Vietnam War, but not quite so disastrous um, for Great Britain. And uh, the British left, not just Hindman, the labour movement, which was beginning to rise, was militantly opposed to the Boer War. Nothing wrong with that. The Boer War was, uh, in many ways, um, a fairly disastrous adventure. But there was an obsession in the left with the role of Judaism, or what they called Judaism. They saw a Jewish conspiracy behind the war that the British Empire had been dragged by a clique of small clique of financial magnates of German Jewish extraction who were involved in the gold rush. This is the time Johannesburg emerges, you know, in the gold fields. And that was one of the reasons, of course, for the Boer War. But it wasn't a Jewish conspiracy because there was a there was a group, some of them were uh, German Jews, most of them were not. The most famous of all those adventurers and speculators was Cecil Rhodes, who certainly was not uh, Jewish on the contrary. He had a whole cult, I would say, of the Nordic uh, uh, race and its superiority. But Heinemann was convinced that the Jews were behind this movement and the attempt to expand the British Empire. And one uh, observation, 100 years later, when Britain followed America into the Iraq adventure in 2003, and the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Tony Blair, was very actively involved in that war, within his party, New Labour, a similar trend began to emerge and there were accusations made, both against Blair, but more specifically those who supposedly stood behind him, which was a clique of Jews, including his advisor on Middle Eastern affairs, Lord Levy, and relations with the Likud, and it was argued that this war was being fought for the interests of Israel. Uh, this was also heard in America, but it was, uh, there was less of an echo. And it's interesting because it was slightly reminiscent of what had happened a century earlier in a, a different context. Karl Kautsky, we come to the turn of the 20th century, was the most prominent, today forgotten, but the most prominent Marxist theoretician in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. He was considered almost like the Pope of international socialism. He was a German Marxist, and what is interesting about Kautsky, whose works were considered a point of reference for all Marxists, including the Russian Marxists and Lenin, even Lenin was uh, you know, regarded uh, Kautsky as an authority, uh, until the First World War. Kautsky was not anti-Jewish. But here we have the beginnings of a Marxist tradition of anti-Zionism, which in its origin is not anti-Jewish, but we can see where the bridge could later be made. Kautsky defines das Judentum, Judaism, which is a double meaning in German. It, it means Jewry as well as Judaism. He defines it as a relic of the Middle Ages, the, one of the last remnants of the feudal Middle Ages, a social ghetto. In fact, what Kautsky is saying, using the method of historical materialism, is that Judaism, meaning both community and religion, is 
the equivalent synonymous with the ghetto. And as long as this Judaism continues to exist, the ghetto exists. And the ghetto is something negative, abhorrent, which needs to be abolished. So therefore it's in the interest of Jews themselves, of the socialist movement, of humanity, to abolish the ghetto and therefore to abolish Judaism. And Jewish identity will then, rather in the sense that the young Marx meant it, will dissolve, disappear. In other words, the progress of humanity, according to this Marxist tradition, demands the dissolution and the disappearance of Jews and Judaism. And Zionism, Kautsky deals with, the first Marxist who consistently deals with Zionism, this is in the period of Herzl. He describes it as a reactionary movement which is trying to obstruct the wheels of progress. It is going against the sense of historical evolution. Zionism is literally a nonsense because it's trying to return, supposedly, the Jews to the ghetto. This was his view. It was also the view of the Russian Marxists who followed him. The Bolsheviks followed Kautsky on this issue 100%. This was Lenin's view of Zionism. And here we see uh, Lenin, who, like Kautsky, is not anti-Jewish. On the contrary, Lenin's writings are full of empathy for the suffering of the Jewish proletariat, Jewish workers, and the Jewish nation. He does refer to the Jewish nation at times. It's, it's rather contradictory here. When he's talking about the suffering of the Jews in Tsarist Russia, the persecution of Jews, their confinement to a large ghetto, the fact they have no rights, no civil rights, no political rights until the Bolshevik Revolution, or, or the previous revolution, in fact. Lenin is very empathetic. But with regards to Jewish culture, the Jewish tradition, religion, of course, atheism, He regards that as the height of reaction. And therefore, assimilation is the only solution to the Jewish question, the only answer to anti-Semitism, but it has to be total assimilation. The Jews and the Jewish proletariat and the movements representing them must fuse completely into the broad struggle of the Russian proletariat. Hence, it, hence his opposition to the Bund. With Stalin, um, very quickly, I would say this. Stalin, of course, is the great shadow over the whole history of communism and, for that matter, socialism in the 20th century. Despite the fact there has never been a true reckoning, in my opinion, on the left, with the mass murders that Stalin implemented on a scale unmatched even by the Nazis if we look at the total figures. Of course, the Holocaust remains unique and the horrors of the Holocaust I would not compare with the Gulag. But if we are talking about the numbers of victims and the massive scale of the suffering that was inflicted first and foremost on the Russian people and the Soviet peoples there was nothing comparable to that except perhaps Mao Zedong in China who was in many ways uh, a true disciple of Stalin. but Mao didn't care about you Uh, fortunately, there were very few Jews and 
China in any case. But with regard to Stalin, already in his earliest theoretical writings, we see the Jews are defined by the young Stalin as a paper nation. They have no soil under their feet, they don't have a peasantry, there's no common link between Jews in America, Jews in Georgia, Jews in Russia, Jews in Tunisia. Uh, you know, sounds plausible. That's what Stalin believed, very dogmatically. Later, he goes through a certain evolution. It has to be said, in the USSR, and Stalin was a Marxist-Leninist, he took it seriously, Discrimination, overt discrimination against Jews was not permitted. It was against the law. And sometimes anti semites were actually punished quite severely in the 1920s in particular because they were a threat to the Soviet regime. And in the 1930s, assimilation was encouraged. And the brunt of Stalin's murderous instincts, if you like, and policies was directed to the Russian peasantry. There was no greater killer of Russian peasants than Joseph Stalin. Millions died. He came to the Jews essentially late in the day, in 1945, after the great victory over Nazi Germany. And those last years, the black years of Soviet Jewry, essentially from 1947 to 53, if Stalin had not died when he did, and the circumstances had never been fully clarified of his death, possibly a Soviet-style final solution of the Jewish question in the USSR would have been carried out. That would not have been a holocaust, but it would have involved mass deportation of the bulk of Soviet Jews to the Far East, or to, uh, to Kazakhstan, or to Siberia. It didn't happen because, perhaps miraculously, Stalin had a stroke, on the 7th of March 1953, which was, believe it or not, Purim. <laughs> we also know that his close comrades did not exactly make any great efforts to call the doctors to relieve, you know, a semi-conscious Stalin or treat him. And shortly before his death, irony of ironies, the notorious, scandalous, so-called doctor's plot, which had been orchestrated by Stalin himself, had more or less removed all the competent doctors from the Kremlin who might have intervened to, um, to save him. And of course everyone was living in a traumatic fear of the dictator and whom he would turn on next. And those doctors were overwhelmingly Jewish, and the charges fabricated against them in 1952 claimed that a clique of Jewish doctors in the service of American and British intelligence and the Zionists were conspiring to poison and eliminate the Soviet leadership beginning with Comrade Stalin. And what is interesting for our purpose is that Stalin, in the dementia of his anti-Semitism in the last years, invents anti-Zionism as a novel justification, cover, masquerade to conceal this elaborate plot that he has devised, which has many goals. It's not only the Jews who are envisaged by this. It's also a tightening up internally of the security organs. It's connected with the Cold War, with um, 
a struggle going on with the United States at the time of the Korean War, uh, China that has turned communist, uh, many issues involved, and the Jews are now perceived by Stalin as a potentially subversive, treasonous element because of their international links. And there is Israel. And here, to this day, there's a slight cloud. Certain things that don't quite add up, although we could perhaps square them, reconcile them. Stalin is, unbelievable though it sounds in retrospect, the godfather of Israel. Stalin, in that one brief window of opportunity, in 1947 to 49, the critical years for the establishment of the State of Israel, is the one who makes the final decision that Israel should be born by providing not just the first de jure diplomatic recognition. The United States is the first country that de facto recognizes uh, uh, Israel, but the USSR is much more supportive in the United Nations for the only time in its whole history, supportive of Israel, of the partition resolutions, and the whole Soviet bloc it takes with it. And every time the Americans retreat from partition, as they tried to do, they retreat in the direction of the so-called trusteeship plan and other things, put an embargo on arms to Israel, and of course Great Britain tried to sabotage and abort the creation of Israel. It was the mandatory power. It did everything in its power to prevent Israel from being born. The USSR was the power that put its entire weight on the side of Israel. Provided the crucial arms via Czechoslovakia which enabled the Yishuv, which was uh, you know, in danger, really, in serious danger, of going under because of lack of equipment and arms, to survive and emerge victorious. And this happens at a time when Stalin is conducting an internal anti-Semitic campaign within the USSR. When he engineered the assassination of the most prominent Soviet Jew of that generation, Shlomo Michels, who was the head of the state, Yiddish theater, great actor, and considered to be the address for Soviet Jews at that time. And Stalin has him murdered. And also arrests the flying flower of the Soviet literary intelligentsia, and they too are executed in 1952. So there we have it, pro-Israel briefly, for very specific reasons, invents anti-Zionism as the cover because he did not want to be seen publicly, officially as anti-Semitic, and communists around the world defended him, including Jewish communists in many countries, including the USA, France and so on defended Stalin, defended the doctor's plot. But now we know the anti-Zionist campaigns in Czechoslovakia, 1952. The leadership of the Czech Communist Party was overwhelmingly Jewish at that time. The Secretary General, the, the number one figure in the Czech Party, Rudolf Sansky, was a Jew. A trial was initiated in Prague. It was a turning point. And at that trial, nine of the 13 defendants who were executed were Jews. And they were all in the top leadership, beginning with Slansky. And they were accused, among other things, of being agents of Zionism. This was the first time ever that these accusations had been made publicly Slansky and all the others 
from their adolescent days were known anti-Zionists. They were so anti-Zionist that Slansky, at the time that Stalin had ordered the Czechs to provide arms to Israel, Slansky opposed it. That's how anti-Zionist he was. And then he was executed as an agent of Zionism. Yes. But we come to 1967, and the way everything turned at that point and changed, everything we have lived through since, including today, ultimately goes back to this decisive event, including the transformation of left-wing attitudes of all kinds, whether communist, Trotskyist, new leftist, anarchist, anti-globalist, and we go down the list of all the different sects on the left. Whatever they believed before 1967 changed within a fairly short time afterwards. But the Soviet bloc, which was the most powerful representative of the left, because of the, not just of its weight as a superpower and, and the different states that were satellites, but the communist parties around the world, which were still a force, in the West, the Italian and the French Communist parties were, were powerful political organizations. They all became not merely anti-Zionist in some kind of a general way, a campaign, an organized, systematic, relentless campaign was undertaken which continued for 20 years, from 1967 until 1987. 20 years of systematic propaganda, both internally within the Soviet system and externally for export, particularly to the Third World, to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, and the West. And what is interesting, just uh, this uh, here on the left, it says International Zionism in Russian there. And what you can see below is an image of a Diane-like Israeli because of the eye patch. The Soviet caricaturists, they loved the Diane eye patch. It became the symbol, the icon of, of, of Israel, but always linked to bloodthirsty activities of the militaristic kind. And on the right-hand side, it's South Africa, because it was the Soviet Union from 1967 and through the 70s that invented the libel of Israel as the apartheid state before anyone else had really latched onto it, before it became the standard trademark in the universities of the West and so on, and we all know that Israel apartheid, we, we're thoroughly familiar with this now. But, you know, I studied this already in the 70s. As it was the first job I had after I came out of university. I went to an institute in London, and the reason, the only reason they employed me was that I knew Russian, and they needed somebody that could actually read this, <laughs> this incredibly rep repetitive and um, turgid propagandist literature which was produced in huge numbers of copies, you know, almost for free. I had my own collection. I used to buy them for a few uh, rubles. It cost nothing, you know, all this anti-Zionist literature. Uh, and South Africa and Israel in 1970s, this was a staple of Soviet and communist propaganda, relentlessly so. They called it the Pretoria Tel Aviv axis of evil. And of course Washington behind it all. Because always there is the hand of the United States, American imperialism. Um, just as in America there was the anti-communist uh, uh, you know, hysteria and frenzies, of course on the other side, I would say it was even more so. So the place of Zionism after 1967 was as, it was a double role. One aspect of it was more standard 
Marxist-Leninist, not necessarily anti-Semitic, but saying Israel is the agent of United States imperialism, West German revanchism, they always included that, and South African racism. The other side, which became more and more dominant in the 70s and early 80s, was anti-Semitic. And it said, the United States is controlled by Zionism, by world Zionism, by the monopolies, so-called that. The Zionists have seized control. And interestingly, often when they in that literature, Zionists include all kinds of non-Jews who are names that embody great wealth, like the Rockefellers. We know the Rockefellers most certainly were not Jewish. But the Rockefellers appear in this li uh, literature alongside Jewish bankers, cosmopolitan Jewish bankers, which is part of a standard left-wing vocabulary from the 19th century. Next. I think we can pass on that because that is the literature I was referring to the trash literature uh, that um, endlessly demonized Zionism in an anti-Semitic way and therefore set the tone for what we have seen since the year 2000 that has infiltrated the liberal mainstream, has become normalized in a lot of the discourse of the, um, I would say, prime media from which we derive our image of the Middle East conflict and many of our assumptions about the rights and wrongs. So we can move on to the next, please. Yeah. Here's a case, briefly, I must allude to this remarkable case of Chancellor Bruno Kreisky. Probably not a household name for, for many in this room. But I certainly will never forget Chancellor Kreisky because one of the first things that I did on, after I got my PhD, um, spontaneous as it were, he was in the middle of a battle with another, a fellow Jew, Simon Wiesenthal, who lived in Vienna, and Kreisky was Chancellor of Austria the first socialist and Jewish chancellor of one of the most anti-Semitic countries in Europe. And Kreisky was elected in 1970, Chancellor of Austria. And he remained Chancellor for the next 13 years, won three successive elections, which was unheard of, democratically, became the most popular politician in Austria's post-war history, certainly a Jew who, even on the most charitable interpretation, would have to be described, if not as a self-hating Jew, at least as a renegade Jew, who was proud of being precisely that, uh, as witnessed by his many statements he made of the kind, I don't submit to Zionism, I reject it, it's true I'm Jewish of Jewish origin, my family is Jewish, but this does not mean I have a special commitment to the Zionist state and the Israelis. I reject that completely. Interesting, nobody had asked him to make a, a public commitment to that. What he had been asked was would he keep a transit camp open in Austria for Soviet Jews in the 70s? And when they were attacked by Palestinian terrorists in Austria, he quickly capitulated, closed down the camp, and made all kinds of statements about how he does not submit to Zionism. But the conflict which revealed the side of Christy, which unfortunately one encounters quite frequently among a certain kind of Jewish leftist, came out in the Wiesenthal affair because Simon Wiesenthal became identified as the iconic figure of the Nazi hunter, of the man who wants to bring the Nazis who were not punished for their crimes to justice. That was 
Wiesenthal's life mission, and it was a thankless mission because he was on his own in those years. He didn't have a great organization behind him. There was no Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles at that time. He was alone, I know, because I visited him, working in this miserable office in the first district of Vienna and in a country that loathed what he was doing because all they wanted to do was forget their own role in the Holocaust as collaborators of the First Order. Remember the Waldheim affair. And Kreisky, when he was elected Chancellor of Austria, despite the fact that virtually all of his own family had been wiped out in the Holocaust, 21 of his relatives, and he had, he had been saved because he was in Sweden during the war years. He comes back to Austria, makes this amazing ascent within the Socialist Party to become Chancellor, and then he announces to the Austrians, I will be Chancellor of all the Austrians. And the first thing he does is to threaten to close down the Wiesenthal Documentation Centre in Vienna. And then he appoints three former Nazis to his cabinet, which Wiesenthal then exposes in a press conference, which earns him the permanent lifelong hatred of Kreisky, who then tries to find ways to get rid of him but can't quite manage to do it. And then in 1975 it comes to a peak because Kreisky needs a coalition partner to form his government and he turns to the Freedom Party. And the Freedom Party is led at that time by a man who, it turns out, was in a Waffen-SS battalion on the Eastern Front during World War II, but nobody knew about it. And Wiesenthal exposed this. When this was exposed, Kreisky goes bananas and starts accusing Wiesenthal of being a Gestapo agent and of a collaborator himself. And he's fed this material from the Eastern Bloc, particularly from Eastern Germany, because they want to get rid of Wiesenthal. And he produces these accusations. And then this wonderful statement, which is quoted in Der Spiegel, in the West German uh, weekly. He's interviewed about the Wiesenthal affair, and it becomes the headline. Der Mann muss verschwinden. The man must disappear. Wiesenthal must disappear. And this saga goes right on to the end of his life. Finally, he has to pay the largest libel damages ever in Austrian history to Wiesenthal for having slandered him. That, that's after he's no longer Chancellor. Uh, for having slandered him as a Gestapo agent. Kreisky is the most significant Western statesman of the 1970s, early 1980s, who supports Yasser Arafat unconditionally. You can see them hugging together. He gives him the red carpet treatment, brings him to Vienna, uh, the recognition of the Socialist International. Kreisky relentlessly pillories Israel in these years, but it's not fashionable yet to the point it will become today that, to do this kind of thing. So that it's important for Arafat because it's his first sort of recognition. He becomes, as they say in German, salonfähig. He's the kind of person that you can, you can accept in your salon, but uh, it's the beginning of his respectability. Next. This, very briefly, all I want to say about this is Jose, no longer with us, Jose Saramago, Nobel Prize for Literature, Portuguese novelist, very talented, actually translated into Hebrew, ironically, um, and much admired in Israel. But when he came to Israel and Palestine in the year 2002, um, among other things, there, there was this statement where he talks about the way that the Jews use the Holocaust. They abuse the Holocaust. They endlessly scratching their own wound. They keep it bleeding. They want to make it incurable. So that, and then he says, why they do this? Because they're covering up their crimes. 
because Israel is a racist state by virtue of Judaism's <coughs> monstrous doctrines. Racist, not just against the Palestinians, but against the entire world, which it seeks to manipulate and abuse. And Saramago is greatly admired intellectual, a member of the Portuguese Communist Party, should be said, for many, many years. Um, he comes to Ramallah, and this is the beginning of Operation Defensive Shield, after the atrocities of the Second Intifada, and Israel enters the West Bank to put a stop to that. And he visits Arafat, and he makes it, calls a press conference there, and he says, the, the bottom line is, Ramallah is Auschwitz. And this becomes a pattern that has never stopped. Through the beginnings of the 21st century, of course it began earlier, but this is the pattern. Genocide. Israel is now linked by uh, not only by Nobel Prize laureates, Gunter Grass is another that comes to mind, uh, and, and there's a whole roll call of people, uh, the intelligentsia, artists, sometimes politicians. The projection onto Israel of the crimes of the Holocaust, the linkage, almost any self-defense action undertaken by Israel, even if it is very minor, in its scale, becomes defined and is picked up by mainstream media in an uncritical way, repeated very often. It becomes not merely a massacre, it becomes a genocide. And everybody uses this. So Mahmoud Abbas appears a few months ago in the United Nations. He says, the Gaza war, right? genocide. Israel perpetrated a genocide. 2,000 people killed in a war in which, you know, there is uh, all the casualties that happen in a war, that becomes a genocide. But the ease, the frequency, the recklessness with which this terminology is used today is shocking. In the course of this year alone, every place I found myself, whether it was Cape Town, South Africa, where I found myself in the midst of a demonstration primarily by Muslims, um, they were all carrying banners like stop the genocide in Gaza. Same thing in Paris this summer, in Berlin. And even if it's Muslims who are in the forefront, there is a chorus behind that and what lends it legitimacy is the willingness um, of mainstream channels and indeed often, unfortunately, of Jews themselves to lend a hand to this, to actually promote it, to encourage it. Next. <coughs> now we're coming close to the end, almost there. Uh, I have to say a word about somebody I knew personally, Mr. Ken Livingston. Mr. Livingston, I presume. Um, I met this gentleman when he was still an up-and-coming Labour politician, a local politician in London, who was seeking my vote when I was still a resident of London in the late 1970s. He knocked on my door. I was living in Hampstead. He was a candidate for Hampstead. And this is a true story. I let him in. I didn't know who he was, frankly. He has this Cockney accent, very affable, very pleasant. He said, I'm canvassing your vote. May I come in? And he said, by all means, I told him. We go into the living room. Well, I knew nothing about him. And um, it so happened that on the desk was a copy of the second book I had just published, second book in my life, which was about Leon Trotsky. <laughs> and it was called Trotsky, Fate of a Revolution. It had just come out, so it was there. He saw it. His face lit up. It was like a moment 
an epiphany. <laughs> Trotsky. And he sat down. Oh, we must talk about this. And so we have this chat, and it turns out this man is a raving Trotsky, uh, an unconditional admirer. And he was so thrilled by this. Um, and then gradually I came to, I, I became more interested in his career. Two years later, Ken Livingston becomes the head of the GLC, the Greater London Council, which controls the municipality of the capital city, a huge city, eight and a half million people, becomes a rising force on the left wing of the Labour Party, starts to tone down his Trotskyism somewhat because this is what's called entryism. The Trotskyists talk about how you enter a movement to infiltrate it and take it over, which is exactly what happened to the British Labour Party in the 1980s. And I discovered in the Lebanon War, the first Lebanon War, 1982, he's the editor of a newspaper called Labour Herald. And one day there's this caricature, must have been June, sometime in June 1982, of Mr. Begin, then Prime Minister of Israel. He's standing on um, a great mound of skull bones, and there is smoke in the distance, blood pouring out of this, this uh, mountain of skulls. He's dressed in Nazi uniform. He has uh, a very accentuated Jewish face, and uh, he's raising his arm like that in a Hitler-style salute. And underneath it, in Gothic English letters, it says, the final solution. And then above it, Begin is supposedly mouthing these words, sneering. He has a sneering expression. He's saying, who needs shalom when you have Reagan behind you? And this was the newspaper that Ken Livingstone produced. And through his career, he was a consistent, relentless anti-Zionist. Now, between 2000 and 2008, this man was the mayor of London. And that's a very powerful position. Maybe more so than the mayor of New York in relative terms, right? Because London is much more important proportionately to the United Kingdom than New York is uh, to the United States. And uh, he had real power. And he used it in every way. And one of the ways he used it is by hugging this man, Sheikh al Karadawi, the most important Muslim cleric of the Sunni Muslim world. The, the man who produces fatwas that are truly authoritative, who has his weekly program going out of Qatar on Al Jazeera, which is followed by millions of Muslims and who was invited to London twice, given the red carpet treatment by Mr. Livingstone, hailed as a progressive, as a role model for British Muslims. And just to give you a little glimpse, the next, if we can move on to the next, a quote, no, we, sorry, if we can go back one, sorry about that. Uh, okay, I think we have to... In the name of Allah, one quote to summarize Sheikh al Karadawi's viewpoint on Jews, the Holocaust, and Islam. Throughout history, Allah has imposed upon the Jews, the Jews people who would punish them for their corruption. The last punishment was carried out by Adolf Hitler by means of all the things he did to them even though they exaggerated this issue, he managed to put them in their place. This was divine punishment for them. Allah willing, the next time will be at the hands of the believers, meaning the Muslims. This is fairly representative of the message of Mr. Ankara Dawi 
when it comes to this issue. This is what is termed by a leftist, Labour militant in Britain as a role model for a progressive role model for Muslims. This is the Islamic Marxist alliance or one aspect of it that has emerged in the last decade, of which there are many examples, uh, of which the last and the final one uh, relates to Iran. But rather than dwell on the terminology of the Iranian leadership of the Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the supreme guide of Iran to this day, who literally cannot free himself, I would say is addicted to defining Israel as the cancer of the Middle East. The cancer. Which unless it is uprooted, there will never be peace and harmony. This view of Khamenei and of the Iranian leadership, uh, which is reflected also in movements like Hezbollah and so on, and Hamas, which is I think even more overtly and blatantly genocidally anti-Semitic in its outlook. This is taken, this is my last point, this is taken with an astonishing, I would say, mixture of indifference, of almost casual disregard, uh, treated as a marginal, very minor aspect barely mentioned, occasional lip service to it in all discussions, whether it's of the Iranian nuclear threat, whether it's of uh, Israel against versus Hamas, or any other aspect of radical Islam and the threat it poses more generally, not just to Israel, poses to the West, poses to Muslims themselves, let alone ISIL and all the other jihadi movements who are demonstrating to us day after day, in fact, what is currently the predominant face of jihadi Islam to the world. And the, the apathy, the disregard with which this is held, and not only by the left, here I would say this indictment has to be extended across the board. The, le the left should be ashamed of itself that it doesn't respond, but so should everyone else, whatever their political persuasion. This is where we are at today. And uh, what is uh, shocking, but not surprising in the light of uh, the moment one starts to study it intensively, is that those, and I come back to my starting point, those who claimed and who believed, I'm sure sincerely, that they were in the vanguard of human liberation, emancipation. I haven't spoken about the condition of women because, of course, where we talk about that in the light of what Islam represents, then it is simply mind-boggling that you know, people who consider themselves to be progressive should not have a word to say, should be resoundingly silent at the fact of the, uh, the future that is reserved for women in, uh, in, in, a, in a world that would be governed by Sharia uh, or by a caliphate, God forbid. And, and this, of course, is one of the great scandals of our time. Thank you. So, thank you very much for... Uh, a very important presentation and insightful. I'm going to start off with a brief question and then we can take Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll please motion and I'll, I'll look for you. Um, one comment, it's interesting. When I was a, um, the president of McGill Hillel as a kid, it was uh, 1983 or 4, and I was also beginning to be active in the anti-apartheid movement, Stokely Carmichael came to Concordia University in Montreal and he, I ended up 
having a debate with him, and I was really put on trial in front of many students for being a Zionist. And why was a Zionist a part of the anti-apartheid movement? So as a young kid, I, you know, and he was an extraordinary, he was, a, he was an extraordinary speaker. And I was sort of in this moment, which uh, was defining in my life. So it's interesting that we share this uh, Carmichael connection. Um, I would like to say, you ended on a very important point, sort of the hypocrisy, not only of the left, but of people who believe in democratic principles, of the right of citizenship, the rights of women, minorities, and the like. And I was wondering if you can please comment on, in August or September, uh, this just a couple of months ago, President Obama addressed the United Nations and he, in his denunciation of ISIL or ISIS, he praised Sheikh bin, bin uh, Baya, who was second in command of the Kaladari Foundation in Qatar, and he praised him as a uh, peacemaker. And as you correctly, aptly, as you and uh, all the research you've done on, on, on uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, they are horrifically anti-Semitic. They're genocidal in their anti-Semitism. And why, first of all, how can a president of the United States praise this character? And how do you explain the, the deafening silence of the media, of the liberal media, and liberal intellectuals in the West and in the United States to this, um, almost, I would say, an abomination? That's my question. You want to answer straight Please, away? Please, yeah. If you can answer that in the moment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, as you've noticed, um, particularly with regard to President Obama and his administration, there is a policy that has been exhibited from the beginning, uh, it's six years now into this administration, that whatever the issue, the question of Islam, however relevant, however almost begging to be addressed, must, by all accounts, be skirted around. The term must never be mentioned. Even in internal memos, we know there are instructions, FBI, people who are supposed professionally to be following uh, those who are considered a threat to security, must never refer to them as Muslims. When Major um, Hassan I happened to be in the U.S. at that time at Fort Hood when that occurred. The cover-up was staggering at every level, from the president down, including the media that were complicit in that cover-up, in avoiding any reference to motivations that might suggest that perhaps there was an Islamic dimension. And in every single case we could take, we see that pattern. Now. When it comes to, um, I think it's been well documented by others who, who have studied the American context, um, we know that there are many complicities between the White House and certain American Muslim organizations which have a degree of privileged access, who are treated um, you know, with kid gloves, who... Um, their, their backgrounds are not looked at closely. Uh, their links with organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood are, are generally ignored. We have the whole issue that I don't want to go into about Benghazi and that cover-up, and there are many others. Uh, more generally, the relationship, whether of the US or of other Western countries, including Britain and France, to uh, Qatar is striking because Qatar, as we all know, is the major funder, for instance, of ISIL. And Qatar was the great backer of Mohammed Morsi and when the Muslim Brothers came to power in Egypt. And uh, Qatar, which is not only a major American base, in the military base in, in the Persian Gulf, but uh, the um, Emir of Qatar will always be a persona grata instantly received wherever he goes, um, including by the French uh, president, since he's brought up 
a lot of the prime uh, property uh, in 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 that increasingly bankrupt country, and uh, we see this double game. Qatar is supporting terrorism of the worst kind, the most barbaric kind, no doubt as a kind of protection policy for itself, but the West is playing along with this, as it often has done, as it did with Saudi Arabia. Because, of course, when we think about you know, the origins of much of uh, jihadism that has caused such ravages around the world in the last decade or so, um, let's not forget, without the Saudi petrodollars, without uh, the madrasas financed and the mosques financed by Saudi Arabia on every continent of the globe, including here in the United States, um, much of this indoctrination will not take place and a considerable part of it, all of it is anti-Western. It's a further paradox. You know, so the great allies of the West are in fact encouraging through their wealth, through their oil wealth, um, anti-Western ideologies, many of them deviating into uh, terrorism, but also anti-Semitism of the worst kind. Because one of the things about the Islamist movements, uh, which is um, so uh, disturbing, is that despite the great differences between them, which really do exist, and perhaps fortunately for Israel, the internal conflicts between these different movements are such that they can never really so far get their act together um, when it comes to Israel. But whether they're radical Muslims or conservative Muslims of the sort of Saudi, Wahhabi type, or whether they're Shia, or whether they're Sunni, uh, or whatever the particular organization they belong to, I mean, they all have a very similar point of view when it comes to Israel and to Jews more broadly. But we are not their only enemy. And increasingly, we are not their primary enemy. And the Sunni-Shia split, even though the Western media doesn't always seem to get it, is far deeper and more critical right now, geopolitically and in other ways, than the Israel-Palestine conflict. Far, far more weighty. And uh, perhaps President Obama actually is beginning to get it, slowly. Because... You know, previously, when Mr. Kerry was chalking up all these traveller miles, uh, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands he's clocked up already, um, he really seemed to be acting on the principle that if only this one little conflict between Israel and the Palestinians could be resolved, everything would fall into place. You know, and peace and harmony would break out in the Middle East, which must be one of the most tragically absurd misconceptions that anyone's come up with. But we've heard less about it recently. Maybe this is just the beginning of a little window of light, you know, that is dawning. That this will not fundamentally change anything in the Middle East. It will be desirable in itself, but it won't change the nature of the Middle East. Which is a partial answer, I suppose. Yeah. Any questions? Question about the Shia Sunni split. Uh, hasn't Iran supported uh, Hamas and Al Qaeda in the past? If there is such a split, why would they do that? Uh, well, let's take the Iranian Hamas relationship, for instance. Um, first of all, it's clear that there's an Iranian strategy on the whole, rather successful um, of waging war by proxy. Iran and Israel have not actually come to a direct clash, and that's largely because, so far, because Iran, Iran doesn't want that. What Iran has striven to do is to surround Israel with its own proxies which at a given moment, if it requires them, could unleash sufficient havoc that this would 
both simultaneously dissuade Israel from any attack on itself and weaken it significantly if it came to a confrontation. It built up Hamas because clearly it was in its interest to have both on the northern border of Israel and on its southern border two organizations that were beholden to it. Hezbollah is completely beholden to Iran. It was an Iranian creation, funded by Iran, trained by Iran, has to follow Iranian orders and is reinforced by the Revolution Guards and pretty much under its control. And when it slightly deviated from its control, which has happened occasionally, it has been called quickly to book. Uh, and Hezbollah is very dangerous because it has 100,000 missiles, much more accurate, much more dangerous um, in, in terms of their quality, uh, and all supplied by Iran. But Hamas, being a Sunni organization, and also a Palestinian organization, despite all the lip service of Iran to the Palestinian cause, I don't feel that historically they are quite as committed to it as would appear. But the great value of Hamas is precisely because it keeps, you know, Israel locked up on that southern border. Just think of it in five years, Israel has had to fight three wars. We call them operations, you know, but actually they're wars. Let's say they're mini wars. Three wars we fought with Hamas. Who is behind those wars? In my view, the first two, Iran. The last one, no, because there was a kind of rift that developed between Iran and Hamas over Syria. Because here came a point of real conflict. The conflict being that Iran's overwhelming strategic interest at this moment is to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. Bashar al-Assad is the most important by far Arab ally of Iran. Iran is not loved by the Arabs. On the contrary, it's hated by the Arabs on the whole. Most Arabs distrust Iran. There is an age-old conflict. And Iran feels the same way. But they have some points in common. Israel is one. Iran banked on its uh, extreme anti-Israel ideology to overcome this traditional suspicion, both between Shia and Sunni, and Iran and the Arabs. Remember, the worst war ever fought in the Middle East in the 20th century was between Iran and Iraq. By far the bloodiest war of the Middle East dwarfs all the Arab-Israeli confrontations many times over. A million dead. A war that went on through the whole of the 1980s. You know, the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, is no secret. It was said the bitterest pill he swallowed in his whole long life was when he felt obliged to call a ceasefire with Iraq. Because they had actually beaten each other to death, you know, to exhaustion. And uh, that tells you the scale of the enmity. Um, now, the Hamas could not stand by anymore, given that its leadership was in Damascus at the time. And they were beholden. Uh, on the one hand, they, they, they were beholden, they were trapped by that fact they were in Damascus. And they, they, were, they were under the shadow also of Iran. And uh, the fact that the Palestinians are Sunni Muslims, and that... Uh, the Palestinians themselves were being killed in Syria by the Bashar al-Assad regime. Of course, another such a revealing thing, the way the Western media glossed over this, far more Palestinians were killed than by Israel 
ever. Just as it happened in the Jordan and Civil War in 1970, Black September. This happened many times. The treatment meted out to Palestinians in Lebanon, also, if you're looking at discrimination, looking at the way that were blocked and still are in Lebanon. Um, all these things are either covered up, played down, ignored. But there is a conflict of interest. The rift, though, is, may well be healing because the Hamas has no alternative but to go cap in hand, bended knee to Iran because who's going to support them? Qatar, yes. Qatar give them money, but that's it. Turkey, yes, would like to do that. And, of course, Turkey, that's a whole story in itself of the Islamization of uh, what was the one secular, you know, country in the Muslim Middle East. Anybody else for a question or comment? Okay. I just have just one question, sort of a, a corollary to the uh, question that you just answered. If Hezbollah is so well armed uh, by Iran, why is there relative quiet, so to speak, on the northern front today? Well, I believe that the main reason for that is simply that the Iranians have made it very clear that given the overwhelming priority of ensuring the survival in power of Bashar al-Assad. For Hezbollah to undertake any opening up of a front or skirmishes or incidents with Israel would be highly detrimental to Iran's interests. It needs Hezbollah to continue what it is currently doing Basically, Hezbollah saved Assad at a crucial moment. Hezbollah has become a very well-trained, experienced force during this fighting, much more disciplined than the forces at the disposal of Assad. And the crucial battles that took place in that part of Syria that would ensure the connections between uh, Damascus and the, uh, the Alawite strongholds in the northwest, when they were in danger of losing their grip, Hezbollah entered the fray. They held the line, they pushed back um, the rebels, and Iran overwhelmingly wants Hezbollah in that role. So any opening up of a front with Israel would be entirely counterproductive from the Iranian perspective. Uh, for Hezbollah, it's slightly different because they paid a price for playing that role within Lebanon because the whole posture of Hezbollah presenting itself for many years as a Lebanese organization, which is defending Lebanon against Israeli aggression. This whole posture has collapsed in the eyes of the Lebanese public because, of course, they are not doing that. So, ideally, they would like to regain some of their prestige by launching some kind of a action against Israel to show, yes, we really are protecting, so-called protecting Lebanon. But they can't do that because they don't decide that. And so they have to continue in Syria um, and even though Assad has gained the upper hand, nevertheless, this civil war could still drag on for many years. It's very inconclusive. And there's so many actors, it's become so confusing. And with ISIL, you know, in, in, in the mix, nobody really knows where it's going. So, Larry, I'm so the professor of Columbia on the board of this guy. Well, thank you.
and kind of a breadth of historical perspective and roots of the things that we're facing today that we don't often sort of see it in, the, uh, in, in that historical context. So thank you for that. But it, it does leave me thinking that it, it's almost easier to understand um, the Nazi ideology, which came from out of um, a presumption of a kind of racism, it was founded in a kind of racism. It's almost harder to understand how the left today in a society was reacting to the others, reacting where almost the zeitgeist is all about being anti-racist, all about tolerance, and all about inclusion. How is it possible the contradictions that you that you lay out so barely, you know, bear, bear for us? How, how are they possible? How do you understand their happening? Well, you you put your finger on one of the most um, one of the thorniest and. Um, most difficult aspects of this problem because firstly you're quite right to say that when we look at the left in comparison with right wing fascist or even more Nazi anti-Semitism it's much more confused uh, in a way fragmented it's it doesn't have this uh, single-minded, relentlessly coherent, if irrational, uh, element that characterized Nazism. Uh, the Islamists do. They are much more comparable. But the left, whether Marxist, whether anarchist, or whatever, Trotskyist and so on, we cannot compare them in, on that level. And as you have suggested, and that is the most, I think, problematic aspect, their declared and often vehement anti-racism confuses the issue. Because at first glance, those who so insistently proclaim and sometimes act on the grounds of anti-racism in a militant way. How could they, this is what they themselves say all the time, um, how can we be described either as racist or as anti-Semitic or as prejudiced? Um, and they become indignant. And at one level one could almost understand this because after all I'm quite sure that the people who engage in militant, anti-racist, anti-fascist activity actually believe what they say and that uh, they are entirely immune to these, uh, to these attitudes. Uh, but, of course, the test is not really in the self-proclaimed ideology or declarations or programs of movements, parties, individuals. When we look, um, let's take the French case because it's particularly familiar to me and uh, I could observe it very closely up front this summer uh, during the period of the um, very often violent demonstrations that took place in French cities and in Paris and um, which had a definitely an anti-Jewish content um, and were triggered by the Gaza war. Left-wing organisations were prominent in organising and in providing a sort of legitimacy uh, to these ostensibly anti-Israel actions. For example, the demonstration that I witnessed a, a small part of um, that involved a, a siege of a synagogue in uh, Rue de la Roquette near the Place de la Bastille. Uh, it was actually organised by left-wingers, a movement called, um, if I can remember it rightly, the new anti-capitalist party 
That is a, that's, the, that's the new name. They used to be called La Ligue Communiste Révolutionnaire and they were a Trotskyist organization. When that went out of fashion, they changed their name and they called themselves the New Anti-Capitalist Party. They organized the demonstration in the Place La Bastille on the eve of the national holiday in France, 14th July, right, this year. And the mainstream of this organization, uh, uh, of this demonstration, which then advanced towards the synagogue eventually um, and tried to enter it by force, and they were waving Palestinian flags and they were shouting um, Islamic slogans. But they had been called together by these. Trotskyists, I call them Trotskyists. It's quite a strong movement still in France. And they always proclaim their anti-racism in the strongest possible terms. But when you put it to them, come on, but this... What is this anti-racism? What do you imagine if uh, breaking into a synagogue... Um, laying siege to Jews who are, you know, worshipping. The thing is that they don't, they simply don't see it that way, refuse to see it that way. They see um, the French Jews or Jews in the diaspora more generally who identify with Israel, it would appear they are responsible. They are responsible because there is this unconditional support for Palestinians within these anti-racist organizations, which turns the whole issue between Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and Hamas in this case, into a clear-cut case. There is absolute justice and absolute injustice. Israel represents and, in, and embodies evil in their eyes in the sense they are Marxist kind of sense of oppression, the oppressor, and this is an either or ideology. And nothing can shake this view. It is, uh, it is a classic case of dogma, and, and, and the dogma at the very least, what we can say is its effects are anti-Semitic independently of what its motivations are, which may subjectively actually not be connected with anti-Semitism in any way. But the people they ally themselves with, the consequences of the actions, the relentless pillaring of Israel, and the way it is presented, de facto leads to um, these consequences. So I agree, it needs to be distinguished carefully from it. It has nothing to do with Nazism at all. But they are perfectly happy to be in alliance with organizations whose, whose anti-Semitism is not only indisputable, but is often annihilationist. And that is indefensible. So we have time for one more question. I'll just say it, it's actually terrifying in a sense. If you look back to the summer, the situation in the summer in France, and the inability of the anti-racist leftists in France to speak out strongly against the attack or the impending attack on the synagogue in, in Paris, one wonders what happened yesterday in Jerusalem, given that dogma. You know, is there an inability to even speak out when there's a modern-day pogrom in a synagogue in Jerusalem? And it's it's a terrifying situation. And if if, is, if, the, if current anti-Semitism is focused on the demonization of Jewish peoplehood in Israel, um, will this type of anti-Semitism also be homogenized or, or, or I don't know what the right word is acceptable in some sense even in Europe? I mean, what will what will be outrageous uh, in in the future? But anyway, yeah, just. Okay. Any, any other questions? Do we have time for one more question?
that. Do you think that the Democratic Party will remain for Israel, although some of these people for aggressive elements, including the universities, are on I mean, that's a, that's a predictive kind of a question. No, I didn't quite uh, that. Can you please repeat the question? I said, do you think that the Democratic Party will remain for Israel, in the U.S., although some of its elements, the more progressive parts, are anti Israel? I see. You're asking me whether I, I think that the Democratic Party in the United States will continue to be supportive? Yes. If it is supportive. If it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yes. I mean, from what I from what I hear, you know, this is not an area that I claim any particular expertise. But what I read, what I hear, uh, the pattern seems clear that there, at least when it comes to Israel, as opposed to, uh, say, domestic uh, issues of concern to Jews in America, uh, then. There seems to be a much more solid, stronger support uh, in the Republican Party in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, and that from the voting patterns, from various indications that we have. That is the trend. Is that a reversible trend? Oh. How much is it influenced by the president mm -hmm. and his immediate advisors? Mm -hmm. uh, things seem to me were different, for instance, with uh, Bill Clinton, but that was another time. And there are demographic and other trends that also have their longer term influence. Um, and the way the Democratic Party, you know, the kind of support it draws from other constituencies may also lead it in a direction that moves perhaps more away from Jewish concerns in the longer term, but, and particularly with regard to Israel. So that may well be the trend. American Jews so far, uh, even though the question seems to be asked in each new election, will there be a shift in the Jewish vote or not? Um, it has not happened really since... I think Reagan was the last Republican president who really drew a significant proportion of uh, the Jewish vote. Um, again, a lot could depend on the candidate and uh, things that we can't necessarily foresee. The trend at the moment seems clear and the Democratic Party, even though it is still, as far as I know, uh, very significantly funded by Jews and supported by Jews, uh, is not very supportive exactly. of Israel. So you, that also is the question about how Jews perceive their interests and how they regard Israel itself and what kind of a priority, if any, they give to it uh, in, in the overall picture. And uh, yeah, that raises a lot of question marks about, uh, as an Israeli, I have to say, I'm being very diplomatic. Right. Right. Thank you.